It is a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Zonia Wynas. Did I pronounce that right? You got it correct. Zonia yeah. Wynas. And if you're looking at the notes, there's a little squiggly thing above the end. Tanya, tell everyone what that is. It's a, what'd you say? It was a Spanish it's tilde? A Spanish, it's a Spanish tilde. That's what gives it the pronunciation of Zonia versus the thousands of other variations that I get. Well, it's very, very artistic. Thank it's you. almost like a brand in of its own. Zonia is a dental marketing strategist, international speaker, and author. She founded Golden Proportions Marketing, which is goldenproportions.com, in 2001 after the marketing she did for her husband's general and cosmetic dental practice was published in a book about successful cosmetic dentists interrupting family dinner one night with numerous calls from dentists around the U.S. who wanted to experience similar success. At Golden Proportions Marketing, Zonia leads a team of 20 dental marketing professionals who have grown over 1,400 private group and multi-location practices. Driven by a love of strategies, she provides data-driven dental marketing solutions that address every stage of the marketing process, from branding to lead generation to tracking and return on investment. Zonia is an invited lecturer on dental marketing, speaking to national audiences at the Greater New York Dental Meeting, Yankee Dental Congress, the AACD, the BACD, and numerous state dental meetings and study clubs. She has been guest faculty for Six Month Smiles, the Pink Institute, LVI, and was an invited author on internet marketing for the American Dental Association. It is an honor for you to be on the show today. And dentists, um, they never want to talk about uh, why they still need new patients after they've been practicing 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Uh, they never want to talk about all the people who call up and say, hey, are you open evenings? No. Hey, you open weekend? No. Hey, Eddie, can you put me to sleep? No. Do you have nitrous? No. They just want new patients, so they're going to love you today because no one wants to fix what's wrong with their office. They just want to keep getting more and more tons of new patients. So my first question I want to ask you is um, you've been doing this for 20 years. Has, mm -hmm. has marketing changed from 20 years ago today? Oh, it's changed dramatically. When I started, it was a print-driven world. It was brochures and print ads and radio commercials, traditional stuff, the internet barely existed and now most of the rest of it is dead it's all internet driven not that the other stuff isn't still valuable but it's it's completely flipped so so do you do you see that the uh, younger dentists get the digital marketing better and the older guys don't absolutely uh, the older doctors that I run into have a tendency to they don't want to admit that they need marketing in the first place because they didn't grow up with it. It was taboo. If I didn't get a patient by a referral, there's something wrong with me. The younger guys just know that that's the way that it is. It's a competitive market. And if they want to thrive, they have to market. So the older doctors come along, they're just a little more reluctant. So if someone's listening to you right now and, uh, and they go to the website goldenproportions.com. What are, what are they going to find? What, what are you doing for people? Well, that's what I love about what I do is we are completely full service. Since the day that I started uh, this agency close to 16 years ago, I've been doing dental marketing for 20 years, but the agency for 16, I always believed that it was not a single solution kind of a thing. I have doctors who call us every single day who just want to do direct mail who just want a new website, who just want um, someone to develop their logo. And it, that's not a smart way to do dental marketing. It has to be completely comprehensive, a long-term strategy. So when you go to our site, you're going to see that's what we do. We do absolutely everything from the strategic planning, through the implementation, through the tracking, to make sure that every possible aspect of your practice marketing is covered. So, so um, let's start going through all those uh, things. So, so go, go line item by line. When, when you talk about comprehensive, like what all is involved? You mentioned direct mail, website, logo. Let's start with direct mail. So I, I'm 54. I, I, I built my whole dental empire on direct mail. I mean, I lived in a 85044 and every quarter I mailed them, uh, well, it would be four sides. It's just a, what do you call it? An 18 by 36 folded. Um, yeah, big one. So it, so it'd be four sides. It's the four sides of an eight by ten, and mm -hmm. I would just write. I would just rant about dental sealants or gum disease, throwing some pictures. Always get a staff photo, and I mailed that to uh, every uh, buddy that lived in my zip code every, four times a year. I mean, it was just a cash cow. How 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 does that how does that work today in 2016? Well, it's definitely a little bit different. 
people are very suspicious of external marketing. They're, it's very inbound driven. They want to have their own search turn up a result as opposed to someone pushing marketing to them where they then have to take that effort to go check you out. So while I love direct mail and we do a ton of it, people are still taking that next step. They're going to the website, they're reading reviews, they're talking to their friends and neighbors still. So the direct mail has to be viewed as just that initial first step and you have to make sure that the next phase that they're going to is actually gonna convert them from that suspicious lead into someone who's gonna call your practice. Okay, so let, so I gotta tell you, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna give you a reality check right now and I don't know if it's gonna make you laugh or cry. Every time I'm uh, lecturing or whatever and I meet up at a bar and meet some dentists or whatever and I pull out their iPhone and I say, okay, let's search your dental office and read your views. Not one dental, I've never sat next to a dentist that ever on his iPhone Googled his own office and then he didn't know where the reviews were and then read their, anyway, it was, the, it was the first time that he'd ever even seen them. And uh, it was, it was like, it was like totally news to him. And I mean, we're talking about, I've lectured three times this month. So I don't know if I only attract stupid people, stupid dentists to bars, or maybe, maybe the only ones that go drinking with me at a bars are, are alcoholic brain dead. But do you find that, that dentists aren't even aware uh, that they even have reviews on their name, on their, on people's smartphones? Um, I'd probably say, yeah, maybe 75% of them don't keep track of their reviews. Okay, so, but, so 75%. Yeah, roughly. I mean, and you're completely right. They don't know how many reviews they have. They have no idea if they have good reviews or bad reviews. I mean, one of the first things that we do before we start working with a doctor um, is we'll go online and read their reviews because it tells me if there's a whole other problem that they're not ready to face yet that's going to impact their marketing success. And we discover things that they have no idea are out there because there's 70 or 80 different review sites on the web where reviews can be found. And it's impossible for any one person to keep up with that without technology. So, um, yeah, when you expose them to what people really think, the good, the bad, and the ugly, they have no idea it's out there. So, so, so tell my, right now, uh, our audience, basically our show's an hour because that's their commute to work. Yep. And they uh, they all ask for uh, they want two shows a day. They want a show driving to work and back on to work. And uh, we can't do that many shows, but we try. Um, tell them right now they're driving in their car when they get to work. How do they check their online reviews? Um, well, if there's any technology that they're already using, things like Solution Reach or Demand Force, a lot of those services already have um, basically a function that's part of it where they're screening your reviews, and it's an easy way for you to kind of find them all in one place. If not, there's a ton of services out there. We have one that we call Rave Reviews, where it basically um, curates all of your reviews from around the web, and it's an easy way for you to see them, see what people are thinking about you, and also to ask for them. But more than anything, you need a centralized place to see them so that you can write responses to the good ones as well as to the bad ones. And that's what you do? Uh, it's one of the many things that we do, yeah. And then and that you call that Rave Reviews, R-A-V? Rave Reviews. R-A-V-E. They can go to MyRaveReviews.com, and it's also on our website. MyRaveReviews.com. Now, is that your business, or is that just some service you use? Uh, no, it's one of our products. Um, it's, it's an easy portal login for people so that they can see the reviews, they can respond to them, and they can invite patients to leave reviews um, in a manner that's frankly going to be a lot safer for them because when they invite patients through this service, if a patient has, say, a one, two, or three star review, it can actually get put into a feedback loop where the patient writes essentially an email about their situation that goes back to the practice and it doesn't direct them to Google or Yelp or Yahoo or Facebook to actually write that negative review. Let's the patient get the feedback out and still kind of safely protects the practice's reputation online. So did you think of that name at a rave party? <laughs> I wish I did. I live in the country. We have no social life out here. You, it wasn't 3 a.m. at some rave party with some punk rock band. So, so you talk about dental marketing is more than just generating leads. It should take a 360 view of the marketing process, including brand reputation, the new patient experience, patient referrals and retention, lead generation, how to maximize each lead's potential. Uh, talk, talk about that, that it's uh, dental marketing is more than just generating leads. Okay, not a problem. So most practices call us up and they say, I want more new patients. 
And in reality, they have to look at the whole spectrum of things that's happening because it's not just about lead generation. We do a ton of call tracking and that's where we find, frankly, most practices could stop marketing or do nothing new right here, right now. And if they listen to their calls and they teach their teams how to actually convert these calls, I mean, I always say the front desk gets hired to be a receptionist when in reality, you're hiring a sales professional, someone who really has to know how to answer questions, overcome objections. So it starts right there. You know, if you've got someone good who knows how to convert those opportunities, then you're not wasting the leads. But it continues from the moment they walk into practice, what their experience is like is going to tell them if they're going to refer somebody to you. Um, if they're going to stay in your practice because they like your experience, how you present treatment, how you close on treatment, it's all part of the marketing process. And too often doctors just churn people through as opposed to maximizing every single lead that they get. I know, but, but if they, if they died and were standing in front of God and they said to God and God said, okay, you can ask me any question in the world and I'll give you the answer. The first thing they'd ask is what bonding agent do you use? I mean, they just, they just don't back, back to that. I mean, look at the person answering the phone. She's named after a piece of furniture. I'm the front desk. I was exactly. named after a desk. It, it's not inbound sales. It's not closing. Um, how many, how many strangers do you think call the lady named after a piece of furniture before one gets converted to a butt in the seat? Um, well, considering we have tracked tens of thousands of calls, I can tell you statistically, um, maybe about 32% of calls actually get converted into an appointment. One out of so three. So that patient is, yeah, it's calling at least three doctors on average before they get somebody. And when you start to add that up and you look at not only that, Howard, but the big thing that kills me are the number of people that call the office and the phone isn't answered. And when the phone isn't answered, 80 to 90 percent of those callers hang up and don't leave a message so you don't even know that you've lost that opportunity 32 percent of all calls that are coming into dental offices are not even answered so if you take that times a good conversion rate people are throwing away hundreds of thousands of dollars a year just by not literally picking up the phone and then and then they'll always blame it on obama you know They'll everything's blame, Obama. Fault. Yeah, every, everything's Obama, ISIS, the Chinese, Mexicans. I mean, they they never ever consider that maybe they should look in the mirror, and that's the source of all their problems. So you're saying ninety percent of the people that go to uh, voicemail never call back. The ones that get answered, two out of three don't schedule an appointment. Yet I walk yep. into every dental office, and Doc has two people helping her, and they're mm -hmm. and the, and the assistant in the other room waiting is just like waiting. And then I go up front and that lady looks like she was hit by a hurricane and then ran over by a tornado and, and the phones are ringing. She's telling people to put on, I mean, it's just, it's uh, they, the, the, the dental office is staffed for making the hamburger fry and the Coke, not taking the order and the money. Exactly. And you spend all this money on marketing you call and you say, I need new patients. If you stop and get things right at the front desk, you've got the new patients. You just have to actually invite them into the practice. Do you think um, do you think she would be better if instead of naming her after a desk, we should name her like after the front door? Should we call her the front door lady? <laughs> Actually, uh, or, she's the back door lady. We need to get her to close the back door of patients leaving the practice. So, so, so let's talk about this specifically. How can my homies listening to you? Um, I firmly believe that. Um, I mean, it goes back to customer service with Walt Disney. That you know he had the whole um, Disneyland um, separated into on stage and off stage. Yep. When you were on stage, you couldn't talk because some little Korean girl only knew you speaking Korean. She didn't want to hear you speak English. That'd blow the whole bubble image. And they had all these hidden doors where these guys could sneak behind a tree or a bush and then go off stage, rip that mask off, drink some water, go to the bathroom, talk. Um, do you I, – I firmly believe that once you start recording uh, the business administration people's phone calls, that they play at a whole different level. Do you believe that just the act of them knowing they're being recorded changes their behavior? Uh, yes and no, because one of the things that we also do is we screen every single call on 20 different criteria. And the teams know they're being screened, but the thing is they don't always know which calls they're being screened on because we don't listen to everything. We try to listen to just new patient calls. How you're treating an existing patient isn't usually the problem. 
So if they don't know when a call is coming in, if it was a referral and they look you up online and Google has your regular phone number, that might not be trackable. So I think the teams really kind of just do their regular day-to-day, um, the way that they convert patients. Once we start training them, I see a dramatic change. Like literally overnight, I've seen practices go from 50% appointment conversion to 100%. But what happens is the doctors don't keep on top of it. They don't reinforce it. They don't you know, watch those statistics to see how well the team is doing. And as soon as the team says nobody's paying attention, it slides right back off, completely slacks again. So being recorded isn't the only solution. It's someone holding them accountable on a regular daily basis. And you know what's amazing is um, Heartland, uh, Rick Workman, my buddy, uh, Mm -hmm. owns Heartland. He has 1,500 offices. So he started an operation like this for his offices, right? His 1,500 offices, a call center. Um, if no one answers it by the third ring, it rings over to his call center, them tracking the calls, all that stuff. He, um, the only reason he doesn't expand that is because he's hired every single human in Effingham that could possibly have this job. The town's only 10,000. I mean, Rick says it's so important to Heartland's success. They've hired everybody in the town that is smart enough to do this job. And, and, and yet the dentist listening to you right now, um, they're still wondering what bonding agent your husband uses because he's a dentist. They're like, can you can you just talk about what bonding agent your husband uses? So uh, so what would so tell them what you do if someone wanted to help on this and they went to goldenproportions.com and they said, you know, I I, I want to do this. How much does it cost? How does it work? Do you go to their site? Is it all online? Walk me through. Actually, it. It's pretty cool. It's um, a service that we created. It's called Periscope, and it's actually a dashboard that kind of encompasses all of the marketing that a practice is doing. So it centralizes your results, and then it's easier for you to interpret what your marketing is doing. So we assign tracking phone numbers to every single type of marketing, whether it's a television commercial or your website or internet marketing or whatever it is. And then each call is listened to individually, screened by human beings on 20 different call criteria, because then you can get the team to kind of isolate those two or three little things they need to fix to convert that call into the appointment. And then this same protocol shows you, uh, Periscope will show team member by team member exactly how well they're doing, what things they need to fix. And then we can tie all of that into website analytics, online marketing, reviews. This platform's kind of got absolutely everything. So you're not looking at your marketing in a bubble of just that one thing. You're seeing the bigger picture. So how, so, um, Podcast people are young. Um, they're, um, you know, I, I got a four-year-old granddaughter. My, my friends, uh, if I put a gun to their head and said, find me a podcast on their iPhone, I'd have to shoot every one of them. And every time I get an email, they're under 30. Um, how, how do they learn more about markets? They you just had 6,000 kids uh, walk out of dental school. About 20% of your audience right now is a junior or senior in dental school. The rest uh, graduated. They're working for corporate at associate job. Um, they didn't get any of this in dental school. Um, what book would you recommend on marketing? How, how can they learn more about marketing? You could not have asked me a better question. So that's actually my favorite thing in the world to do. When I started this agency, I saw so many doctors basically get taken advantage of by other consultants, other groups who just weren't as ethical, didn't have the doctor's best interests in heart. So I started a program called a two-day dental marketing MBA. Um, I actually teach it cooperatively with Kirk Barron at Back Dental, and I think you've talked to Kirk before. And so I think that's the best resource because I like doctors to know everything that goes into dental marketing, not so they can necessarily do it all themselves, but so they can make smart decisions. They can determine if their marketing is working or not. So if people go on our website, goldenproportions.com, you'll actually see a registration button so that they can go online and sign up for some of the seminars that we do at Activate. Okay, and so wait, I, I, I push the deal. I push, I push the three uh, horizontal lines. I see who are you, services, portfolio, about us, getting started, blog, contact us. So if you're on the homepage, just scroll up because you're on your phone. Okay, scroll up. And you should see we have all the different uh, dental profiles, which is the, the typical kind of dentist that we get. And right underneath that, you should see a picture of me in a red dress on a stage doing some lecturing 
And there'll be a link there so they can go register for some of these programs. 88 internet marketing experts? Nope, right above that. Oh, there you are in your red dress. How did I miss that? (laughs) Time to train your brain, register now. Want to know what really works in dental marketing? You're in luck because we're ready to share our secrets. Join GPM president, Zonia Winans. Did I say that right? You did. Perfect. ACT, oh, ACT Dental's Kirk Bernhardt. Um, he's from Kansas City, right? He is. He actually just moved to Wisconsin. He's now a che- he. He's a cheesehead. Huh? He gave up the gosh darn Kansas <laughs> City cheese for those useless Packers. So, how often do you give these uh, two day courses? Um, I actually do the two day course, the two day dental marketing MBA, about three or four times a year. And then I also do um, seminars called Activate with Kirk, where about half of it is tied into marketing. And Kirk does a lot of great practice management stuff. So it's kind of a good all around, you know, how to market the practice, how to get the team on board with everything. So, 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 your, next one is, so your next one is February 2nd and 3rd? Next one's February 2nd and 3rd for Activate. And anybody who's listening, all they have to do um, when they go to register is type in promo code GPM100 and they'll get $100 off the registration. Trust me, it is one of the best programs out there. Nice. Okay, so um, my job is to just try to ask questions that I think uh, my homies want answered. And and one of the questions they always email me is, they, um, you know, every year 6,000 kids walk out of school. Uh, going back since I graduated 29 years ago, every graduating class has the same bitch. Um, we didn't get uh, do enough root canals. We didn't do any ortho. We didn't do a space maintainer. We didn't place, you know, blah, 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 blah. And it, it, it's a bad rap for a dental school because to take 100 kids off the street and turn mm-hmm. them loose with a license four years later, I mean, I wouldn't want that at all. But the, one of the main questions they ask is they say, okay, you're a marketing expert. What do people, what are the people searching for? Because should I go learn Invisalign? And short-term ortho um, is, uh, I hear all this about sleep apnea, um, there's dental implants, um, there's um, cosmetics, your husband's a cosmetic guru. Um, what, what, they don't want to go learn, they don't want to go learn and invest a lot of money creating a supply of something no one's demanding. So what they want to know from you is, on Google, what, what, what are people searching for? What, what are great things to provide that people are looking for? Well, okay, so I find that most dentists suffer from what we call shiny object syndrome. The latest <laughs> course, you see it all the time, right? Right. The latest <laughs> course comes out in sleep apnea or CIRAC or um, any technique, short-term ortho, anything like that. And they think that is the savior for their practice. That's the one thing that's going to completely save their practice. What I find is... Actually, the number one thing that people are searching for is they just want a family dentist. You bring that patient in, you build a relationship with them, then you diagnose the things that are fun to do, the cosmetic dentistry, the TMD, the sleep apnea. So number one term on search is dentist for a reason. Yeah, sure, they're looking for six-month smiles. They're looking for um, CIRAC, but not nearly in the same volume that they are for just dentist. Start with the basics and build a relationship. Yeah, I, I thought that it's just it's it's almost laughable um, how um, um, the industry takes over the thinking like like say same same day crowns. Yeah, I've been mm-hmm. a dentist for 29 years. If I told Zanya she needed a crown, 50 percent of her questions are going to be on finance. Well, how much is it? Will my insurance pay? Can I pay him a fine? And then the other half is going to be fear. Are you going to hurt me? Do I get a shot? Are you going to knock me out? Can I have nitrous? Can I have pain pills? You know. I mean, same, can I have this crown in the same day? That comes up like once a decade. Yeah. And then, and then people run out by a $150,000 machine because they think that's what the market wants. And what you're saying is what the market wants is they want a family dentist. The best indication of this, if people go onto their websites and they look at their Google Analytics, I tell them to look at the top 10 pages that patients are interested in. And aside from the homepage, universally, the doctor's bio, the team bio, office tours, and a new patient experience page are in your top five every single time. You are lucky if in the top 10 is a page on an actual service of what you're doing. People assume you're a dentist. You know what on earth to do in their mouths. What they want to know is the person who's going to do it to them. It is really relationship driven. And I think people tend to forget that when we get caught up in this technology and all the cool things there are to do out there. Yeah, they're life changing, but they start by having someone in the practice in the first place. And that's they just care about the doctor who's taking care of them. 
And, and you see no retention of patients in the big volume corporate driven model of burning and churning and all that kind of stuff. It is all relationship driven, isn't it? It really is. That's so, what so, makes great practice. So, so you have this natural selection problem in dentistry. Uh, and the natural selection problem is that if you went to college and you were really cool and you were well-rounded and you joined a frat and had a girlfriend and went out three nights a week and made A's, B's, and C's, you'd never become a dentist, physician, or lawyer. But if you sit in the library every night till midnight, uh, like me and my homies did, I got accepted a year early. And now, now at this age, I look back in embarrassment because uh, the only thing I did was study. And so now you have all these engineers, scientists, doctors, and, and now they find out, they're just now finding out that none of that even matters. It's all the relationship, who's answering the phone, it's how you present the treatment, the finance. How, how do you go from that, I'm a scientist, just give me the geometry, uh, to getting an A and all the soft stuff, the relationship, answering the phone right. What, what is a new patient experience? Uh, how, how does he even know what the new patient experience is when he's back there looking through loops, trying to find a fourth canal and a root canal? So that's where it's important to have the world's best team. And I think too often we get caught up in hiring somebody who's had previous dental experience when a lot <laughs> of that can be taught. I mean, the dentist is the one who has to have the dental experience. And the patients, yes, they want a relationship with the dentist, but they also want a relationship with the whole practice. So if they can surround themselves by a really strong team, I mean, that's what I do here. I, I don't build websites. I don't write content. And and design things. I have a great team who makes me look good. So if doctors can hire the right people, it can make up for a lot of that social inadequacy that you're right. I definitely see a lot of them have some of that struggle. Uh, well, now, I, what, what, what percent would you say uh, of the dentists are, uh, are more the introvert scientists uh, accounting? Um, I would see the thing is the ones that are willing to do marketing, um, or that need to do marketing tend to be more of the introverts because the extroverts naturally have it. They don't, they just got that energy that people respond to. So often they don't have a demand or a need for marketing because people just love them and they've got a great reputation in the community. So I kind of have a biased perspective, but I would say probably in that 70 to 80% of them are, you know, they're science geeks and they're brilliant at what they do. We attract a lot of, um, we call them CE junkies. They absolutely live and die on their continuing education. And we just want them to round out some of those people skills. And that's what a great team can really support them on. You know, I've, I've been at this so long, I can smell it and feel it within 30 seconds of walking into a dental office. I mean, yep. they, they either got that glass wall and a sign-in sheet and you, you think you're in a library and you're looking for uh, Mother Superior, uh, you know, to come in or you walk in there and you just feel fun. And, mm -hmm. and I also see it in a very competitive market is orthodontics. I mean, there's only two types of orthodontics offices. 80% of them are serious about the ortho and it's a library and they're doing 500,000 a year. And the other ones are crushing it two to 4 million a year. And you just walk in there and it's video games and ice creams and the staff's all fun and giggly. And it's just, it just a great fun thing. And it's all word of mouth. I mean, it's, it's just, I mean, you can sense it in 20 seconds. Really? Truly. Yeah. And, uh, so you, you always talk about, uh, half the money you, <laughs> I love that one. Uh, <laughs> that, was, that was the godfather. Who was that? Ogie, Ogie said that was it. How do you pronounce his name? Ogly? Ogly? Uh, no, that wasn't an Ogilvy. That was actually John Wanamaker. He was a, a department store guru. And the quote was, half the money I spend in marketing, or I think it was advertising back then, half the money I spend in advertising is wasted. The problem is I just don't know what half. Yeah. That's why everything has to be tracked. I don't do a single piece of marketing for a client without some sort of tracking component because nobody said I'm perfect. I need to keep adjusting messages and mediums to make something stronger. And there's just too many factors that get in the way of a product's success. So if you aren't actually tracking it, you can't isolate what that thing is that you need to fix. Okay, when I see it, I, I always know when the dentist wrote their own ad is because it's uh, it's frightening. It's like going into, uh, uh, but, but anyway, here's a specific question. A lot of people think um, advertising and marketing is you just throw all these prices out there 
and have loads like like implants, nine ninety nine complete, uh, full denture, four ninety nine, um, new patient exam, cleaning exam, and X ray for seventy nine dollars or ninety nine. Talk about marketing and price. Well, price is one of those. Um, I, I don't know. Price can be a difficult thing because it is one of the first questions out of patients' mouths every time we listen to a phone call. Do you take my insurance? How much are you charging for an extraction? How much is a crown? And in reality, that's not what the patients are actually asking about. People don't buy dentistry based on price. They buy it on affordability. I mean, I always think of it this way. Would you have paid cash for your house? All right, maybe you would have, but most people don't pay cash for their house. In reality, they go get a mortgage. The the truth is I paid cash for my ex-wife's houses. (laughs) Okay, well, so... Does that count? Um, unfortunately for you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. But we're not paying the full price for things. We're buying a mortgage. We're buying what we can afford every month. So people aren't buying on price. They're buying on what fits their budget and what fits their lifestyle. So yes, price is an important part of it. It's where they start the question, but it's not really what the true question is. People who can ask really smart questions, who can dig deep, are going to find out what that true motivation is. And that's where I say it's so important to have an inside sales professional who works the front desk because you can find out what they care about and then your marketing message actually appeals to that particular issue. So how does my homie listening to you right now on the way to work, how does he get his, uh, what, what do you call um, admin people? You call them uh, front desk, you call them the, the yeah, front desk usually. Front desk, uh, uh, dental assistants, uh, whatever. But how, how does how does my homie get his front desk person up to speed? How does he get her to uh, um, go from a one out of three close to a two out of three? He, he could so, double he could double his her new patients without spending another dime if he doubled his close rate. How how does she how does she get uh, her front desk lady um, brought up to speed? So it definitely starts with the tracking. Call tracking has to be assigned to absolutely everything and they need to know that the calls are being screened so that you can figure out what those few things are that the front desk needs help with. Um, You have to have a front desk who has an attitude who is willing to learn, who doesn't take it as this is what I'm doing wrong, but says here's what I'm willing to learn in order to get better. Just like a doctor takes continuing education, same thing for the front desk. Um, personally, I'm a really big fan of All-Star Dental Academy. They do a fantastic job with an online training program um, that teams can do at their own leisure. They get certified in the call training, and I find it makes a big difference. But the big thing is you have to keep measuring it. You can't just sort of measure it once, hope that you fixed it and be done. You have to keep an eye on it, and that's where that call tracking comes in. So all of our clients absolutely love Periscope. It's their number one thing. And that's your product, the Periscope. It is. So it so, is. so how, how, do they, how do they get signed up for that? How much is it? They go to goldenproportions.com. How, how much is this? And t- talk about the program. So the way that it works, um, it depends on how many call minutes somebody is using. So if we're listening to 100 minutes of calls a month, it's, which is honestly a, a pretty typical practice when you're just doing new patients, um, it's $99 a month. It's so unbelievably inexpensive. It's one of the least expensive marketing things that you can do to fix your marketing. And then it goes up based on call volume. So if they're at say 500 minutes a month, which is a pretty decent sized practice, it's a whole $299 a month. It's just inexpensive must do. They just need to frankly go to our website, give us a call. We'll walk them through a demo. And, uh, I, I'm going to tell you, you and I are going to want to have another conversation in a couple of months because this product is about to take a whole nother leap and it's going to connect to their practice management software, automatically tie all of this call tracking together with their results. They'll be able to see their ROI instantaneously for any piece of marketing that they're doing. They'll be able to make really smart marketing decisions. And what's this going to be called? It's called Smart Market Dental. It's actually premiering at the Chicago Midwinter Meeting. And when of and um, what practice management information software will this be working with? 
pretty much everything, about 95% of the platforms, and well, nearly everything out there. So that would be uh, Henry Shine's Dentrix, it'd be uh, yep. um, Patterson's Eagle Soft. What, what else? Soft dent, open dental, um, it, and it doesn't matter what specialties too. It ties in with oral surgery practices, with ortho practice software. Um, when the website goes live, which is we're just in the final beta testing now, um, there'll actually be a list on there so you can see all the practice management software that it connects to, but pretty much everyone will be able to take advantage of this. Very cool. How long have you been working on this? Are you Honestly, this has been my baby for probably the past four years. And it's uh, we finally hit that holy grail when we could connect to their practice management software because it, it's so difficult for practices to pull the numbers out of the software. This stuff is challenging, but it's we can horrible. do it automatically. It Oh, I know it's killer. It, it, it's a nightmare, and and um, and what's sad is uh, um, Patterson and Shine. Uh, I mean, you you. I mean, I I've, I've done everything I could for twenty years. I mean, I've been flying to Melville. I've flown to um, where Dentrix was created in uh, Provo, Utah. I've uh, I, I flew to Effingham, which is in the middle of effing nowhere, uh, a town of ten thousand, to talk to the Eagle Saw people. That you know, if you don't have um, you know, your, your software, it's not hooked up to accounting. So you don't, you don't pay your bills. They don't, they don't, you don't, you, your number one cost staff, the staff don't clock in and clock out. It does. They, they don't know when they schedule an hour for an MOD, they don't even know what they're getting for that MOD. Cause they're signed up with a dozen PPOs and they don't even know what that room cost them for an hour. And so the, the, to call, to call it practice management software, I mean, they should call it Ray Charles software. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, it's just, it's just dead. And, and they, they, they don't, they, they actually don't even care. I, I completely agree. It is one of the most frustrating things in the world for the front desk. They don't know where to get the reports. When they call technical support, nobody knows how to find for them the thing that they're looking for. So that's why I was so excited about this is, is that it's going to be completely automated. It's actually even going to connect to their QuickBooks software so they can tie in an expense related to the marketing and then do that automatic ROI calculation. But yep. they'll be able to see their, their average cost to acquire a patient if a particular marketing source um, is bringing in a high quality patient or someone that has a lot of no-shows or someone that um, just doesn't do a lot of treatment plan conversion. It's gonna give you almost kind of automated marketing advice. You know, it's actually uh, probably the number one reason um, you know, dental income peaked in 2005 at 219,000 a year, and it's been mm -hmm. sliding down about 4,000 bucks a year. And now it's down to 174. So they've lost about $40,000 of real income over the last decade. And it's because of only one thing. They keep signing up for all these PPO plans because they don't know their cost of goods. And if they're Eagle Soft and if they're Dentrix showed them that, mm -hmm. you know, that you're going to lose $48 when you do this filling at this fee. So either do it in half the time or drop the PPO plan, then the dentist would start making decisions and they'd either stop dropping uh, composites and going back to amalgam or they'd start dropping PPOs and the PPOs would say, well, we can't get any dentists to take these plans at this price. So we're going to have to raise the price. I mean, it's uh, um, they're just making horrible decisions because they don't have the data. Yeah, they just don't have the information. So we're going to be able to pull back the curtain on this and tell them, you know, maybe it's uh, you don't take that PPO, you create an in-house dental plan that people respond to. I mean, 30% of the population doesn't even have insurance. So let's capture that market or whatever those opportunities are. It is You've just got to stop wasting money in marketing. And I see that every single day. Okay, so here, here's a, a, a very uh, scary question for you. Okay. Um, like I say, most of the people, probably 80% of the people listening to you right now are somewhere between they graduated from dental school to 30 you know, years old, you know, and they're working right now at Aspen or Heartland or they're associated with old man McGregor in Parsons, Kansas, and they want to go out on their own. So they've seen a place, they, they see I can rent this, they've talked to Patterson, Shine, Benco, they're going to plummet for four, start with two, but the thing that scares them and why they won't jump is they won't have any patients. It, you know, we're talking about a scratch practice. We're talking about a de novo practice. What does this person have to think about? How, what would you be coaching her if she says, I'm gonna start 
a scratch de novo practice. My only other alternative is to buy an existing practice. They're averaging about seven hundred and fifty thousand uh, bucks. Yep. I got three hundred and fifty thousand dollars student loans. I'd, I'd be a million dollars in debt, and I see this nice little two thousand square foot bay next to a you know a, a Starbucks and a neat little place. I really want it. How does she have to think about? feeding this beast when she opens the door with new patients? What would you tell her? Okay, well, if they start with a scratch practice, which to be honest, I really don't recommend that. I believe it is far more profitable and a lot less stress on a practice to buy an existing practice because then you've actually got revenue coming in to service that debt that you immediately have. You're still gonna have debt in a scratch practice. You're just not gonna have nearly the number of patients you need to cover it. But let's say, fine, that you go ahead and do a scratch practice. My husband did 20 odd years ago. And the number one most important thing is your location. Too many people sign a lease for something that's buried inside an office building and there's no visibility for it. And, and this is going to sound like such the antithesis of someone from marketing, but when you are inside an office building, you are committed to the cost of marketing for the rest of your practice life because you have no other visibility unless you're paying for it. Um, and, and that sounds totally wrong for me to actually say that, but I think you're gonna be a lot more successful with a great location. Signage, visibility next to, you know, in a high frequency, high traffic area is one of the fastest, easiest things you can do. Um, big internet marketing, making a splash to let people know you're there. And don't let the banks tell you that you just need a couple of dollars for marketing up front and that you'll gradually build that over time. A, a typical scratch practice takes a good two years for people to have enough to be in there four or five days a week. Um, so they need to budget quite a bit aggressively for marketing, which is just going to depend on where they are. You start up in D.C. and it's going to cost you a heck of a lot more than it is in central Pennsylvania where I am. So um, you're from Pennsylvania, Milton, Pennsylvania. Milton, so, Pennsylvania. So how do you do a marketing program if you're only targeting the Amish? <laughs> you know, it's funny. My husband's first practice when he was an associate actually had a hitching post in the back of the office because the Amish, seriously, honest to Pete. Nice. Yeah. Um, thankfully his office now does not, they have to cross the highway to get to his office. So that that's no longer okay for the Amish. So most people don't realize this, but Kansas has the uh, largest population of, uh, Mennonites. Did you know that? Uh, yes. And what's funny is I believe they also have a Lancaster, just like we do in Pennsylvania. There's something about that name that's important to the Amish and the Mennonite. What, what's the name? Um, I want to say it's. Actually, I could be wrong. It could be Lancaster in Ohio, but I think there's also a Lancaster in Kansas. Prove me wrong. I probably am. I just think it's so cute because uh, when I'm back in Kansas, you see those Mennonites, you see that little girl all dressed up and she's all pretty sitting in a buggy with her iPhone. Oh, they're hysterical. We see them all the time at the local gas station. They'll have somebody else drive them around. They're in their long dresses and their sneakers and their cell phones. They're kind of the dichotomy of what you expect. Yeah, but um, believe it or not, they're great dental patients because they're all cash. Right. And their community saves up to do the work that they need to do. I know. So in my practice, I'm in Phoenix, Arizona. So one, um, uh, I would say 25% of my three mile radius speaks Spanish as a primary language. Mm -hmm. And in 29 years, I can, they're the best patients. They pay in cash. They make their yep. appointments every financial problem I ever had was with a millionaire. I mean, one, one of these ladies owns two restaurants and stiffed me on uh, her work. And it only tell I had a lawyer send her papers that she paid. I mean, just the rich are rich because they don't part with their cash. That's exactly what I was going to say. Yeah. Rich people will never part with their cash and the poor, they're always smiling. They bring you homemade. Uh, um, um, what are those the corn tortilla things they make me? No, those. No, not chimichangas. What is it they bring? The corn. Huh. Anyway, they bring they they bring food. They bring cash. They're just the. I I would take a practice uh, focusing on the poor any day of the week. Um, you said something extremely profound. In two thousand eight, the United States had a um, a full blown depression, just like nineteen twenty nine. Except in nineteen twenty nine, they tried to save the dollar, so they lost um, probably 
25% uh, of the banks, and we had a contraction uh, from 32 to 36 with 25% unemployment. They learned their lessons. In fact, uh, the, um, the, the head of the Federal Reserve uh, from MIT, he did his doctorate thesis on the Depression. So he knew in 2008 to um, do not save the dollar, save the banks. And so right. he, he printed $8 trillion of money that nobody would even find out about for two years while the Congress passed $800 billion for a loan. He was just printing it because right now when you go around the world, there's $70 trillion. Um, $60 trillion does not exist. It's all in, in numbers and computers and banks. There's only, only uh, $10 trillion uh, is actually in paper, cash, you know, uh, whatever. But in that 2008 contraction, half of all the bankruptcies were the startup scratch practices. Yep. And the other half were the older dentists, uh, my age, um, who were specialty high-end cosmetic implants. Oh, yeah. I saw a lot of those. Yeah. And they, they couldn't, they had lost their skill set. They couldn't go back to extractions and fillings and a recall and they, they, they couldn't adjust down and, and they would even say, well, I, I can't do a molar root canal. I say, well, how do you, what, what can you do? And they'd say, I can only pull out all your amalgams and crowns and replace them all with Empress glass and veneers and everything they could only do was a 35 to $50,000 cosmetic makeover and they had lost all their family dental skills. And so, so yeah, so you said something very profound that um, it's scary, but a scratch practice, you think you're saving a lot of money, but buying a existing business with patients and customers and cash flow, that's just much, much lower risk, isn't it? Well, I mean, it's, if you think about it from any business perspective, it's a lot more profitable for a business to acquire another business than it is to start a new one from scratch to build up that whole customer base. So it, the same message applies to dentistry. And you know what, I got a comment um, for all those practices, those big high-end cosmetic and specialty practices, it wasn't necessarily so much that they lost their skill set. I saw a lot of pride. They didn't want to admit that they had to go backwards. And um, I saw a lot of them, they'd retire early or they became associates somewhere else because they just love doing that high-end specialty stuff, but there wasn't a demand. I tell every one of my practices, you gotta be 75, 80% bread and butter dentistry and 20% is the fun stuff. If you do nothing but specialty marketing, you are setting yourself up for future failure because there will be another recession at some point in time. So um, on our show, um, th there's nine specialties recognized by the American Dental Association. And we have lots of uh, fans of the show um, that are specialists. Uh, I, I've had like, like every endodontist who's ever wrote, written a book or a textbook has, has been on this show. Um, is there any difference in what you do between specialist and general family dentist? Yeah, absolutely. Um, as a matter of fact, it's getting harder and harder to market specialists because so many GPs after the recession, they realized that they needed to expand their skill set. They didn't want to send dentistry out the door to somebody else that they could learn to do it on their own. Their own, and that's why all these implant courses and short-term ortho courses and and all of that have become have become so popular because they don't want to send it out to a specialist. So I actually get a lot of calls from specialists who are looking for help because they can't count on the referrals that they used to anymore. And all of their marketing before was referrals from GPs. Now they have to go direct to consumer. Oral surgeons have to market implants direct to consumer. Same thing with perio and prosto. And it's a whole new world for a lot of them. It's kind of earth shaking, I see, for them. Which of the nine specialties would you say is at the lead of going straight to the consumer and bypassing the dentist? Um, I would probably say periodontists or oral surgeons, anything that's doing dental implants, because, you know, implants have gotten so big after the recession, they're almost a cosmetic procedure, and yet the consumer can justify it because there's a medical need for it. So um, people are willing to spend money on implants. They still want that cosmetic result, but they aren't willing to do cosmetic dentistry just for the sake of aesthetics. So the oral surgeons, the periodontists that can really push those implants, those are the ones that are seeing the biggest success. But I, I want to say something. I'm, I'm afraid some of your stuff is so profound, it might be flying over their head. But 
when she said it's not price, it's affordability. Look, look at um, Clear Choice. They're mm -hmm. they, they're selling about uh, about eighteen to twenty thousand arches a year at twenty five grand. And yeah. in America, if it's over a thousand bucks, only ninety percent pay. I'm mean, only ten percent pay cash for cars and houses and all that stuff. So right. so so if they're selling that twenty five thousand, the reason they're selling it is because they're they're not selling the twenty five thousand. They're selling the affordability. They're they're finding them financing. They're saying, hey, we can do this whole thing for four ninety nine a month for sixty months. They're making it affordable. And go back to that twenty five thousand dollar arch. If they did a coupon on price that well, it's regularly twenty five thousand, but if you buy it today, it's only twenty two thousand. Well, if you ain't got twenty five thousand, you ain't got twenty two thousand. You wouldn't have had eighteen thousand. You wouldn't have had fifteen thousand. They only have five hundred dollars a month. Or seven hundred dollars a month. It's all on making it affordable, not the price. And that's what you were saying. Absolutely. Honestly, I wish there were more practices that operated like orthodontists did, where orthodontists know that they have an in-house payment plan, and you know, there's such a huge population that does ortho, and they just expect they're going to make up an automatic withdrawal from their checking account every single month. If more dental practices had some sort of in-house financing, and I know there's always that financial risk, but you're going to get much more commitment on bigger cases if people know that they have that financing, whether it's through Care Credit or Springstone or, or within the office itself, you're going to see a lot more conversion on big cases as opposed to this nickel and dime dentistry they do now. Okay, well, you, you just uh, said two things. You said in-house and mm -hmm. then you mentioned external financing through a third party like Care Credit. Which one are the orthodontists doing more? Um, I think it depends on the practice. Most of the ones that I work with um, actually do in-house financing. They, they carry their own paper. Yep, they're willing to extend the credit to the patients. They and, still have to make a down payment. And you know, granted, the patient is in the practice for two years, so you kind of have some commitment and some obligation. But I think there's ways to set that up within a dental practice. Um, that's just going to make it a lot more amenable for your average patient. Uh, Bruce Baird is talking a lot about that. He's big into mm -hmm. in office. Have you heard him or? Uh, yeah, familiar with him. Yeah. Um, but the external financing, you said Care Credit. What was the other name of the company? Uh, Springstone, but I think they just recently got sold out to, um, I can't think of who it is off the top of my head, but to a larger financing group. I always like Springstone because they would do big payment plans for uh, for people that have like major full arch kind of cases to be done. And, you know, care credit, I love them, but they tend to be more for kind of the general everyday dentistry. They don't go in the twenty five, thirty thousand dollar $30,000 range for financing. You know, one of my uh, very good friends uh, made so much money here in Phoenix. He started his own, uh, carrying his own paper for cars because there's mm -hmm. this whole market of people that can get, and he called it ugly duckling car, ugly, ugly duckling cars. And the whole deal was they finance their own paper. And they're, you right. know, here we are in Arizona, we're a hundred miles from uh, the Mexican border. There's just so many people that are outside the, the, the financing system. And he figured all of that out and he had a team of people and he'd find out, you know, who, where they work and where they live, the whole nine yard. And he made so much money, it was crazy. I mean, it was just crazy success um, because, again, he was making it affordable. And that, that's a big part of dentistry on, uh, for the middle class is making it affordable. So, and uh, honestly, that's a big part of marketing. Every single piece of marketing should have some sort of call to action that talks about affordability. Um, anybody that does zero interest financing or payment plans or you know, anything that they can do to make that affordable, even just saying, we find a way to make dentistry affordable for your family so you can get the care you need. That's a great conversion call to action in marketing. It should be everywhere. So um, what do you think about in, in your, um, how long is your husband practicing? How, how long uh, is I think he just hit 20 years this summer. Well, so, in his private practice, so a couple more than that. So 20 years. Uh, so 20 years ago, you and your husband would submit the fee for a crown or a filling or whatever, and the insurance just paid a percent. 20 years later, the insurance company said, no, 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 we're going to send you the fee and it's called PPO. And yeah. those fees are about 40% less and 82% of the 211,000 dentists in the United States of America accepted them. What, how do you think that's been a game changer in dentistry? 
Um, I think doctors are feeling like they're almost kind of railroaded into it. Um, Obamacare, I think, sort of set this precedent that people have this assumption that they are going to have some sort of insurance that's going to cover things and that they have to go somewhere that covers insurance. So I think it's kind of a slippery slope they got into. Most of the practices we work with are trying to get out of PPOs, get out of insurance because the reimbursements are so bad. Um, but more and more signing on because there's almost this tidal wave of consumer demand. And that's where I see this huge opportunity. You know, 30% of the population doesn't have any dental insurance at all. So let's focus on those folks. Let's find ways with it. Your own in-house dental plan. Those are growing like crazy. Rather than paying out to the insurance company, why don't you set what your discount is going to be? There's just a lot of ways to not go down that PPO road if you can avoid it. And how much money should they be spending on marketing and advertising? So it depends on the size of the practice and the market you're in. I like to say if you want to come out of the gate swinging and you got a new product introduced or you need to really catch up to the competition, you're probably looking at a good 5 to 6% of collections. Once you hit a maintenance phase where things are steady, you're still looking at 2 to 3% at the very least. Okay, so tell me this. So I say, you say, okay, doc, I'm, I'm gonna need you to spend 5%. Every nickel of every dollar collected needs to go to advertising. And she says, no. And then I'm <laughs> send her a PPO contract and say, hey, do your work for 40% cheaper. Okay, where do I sign? Why, exactly. why, why, does, she, why does she resist investing 5% to go after the one third of America that'll pay cash on a debit card? and won't blink as signing a contract to do all of her stuff 40% off. Well, obviously that's logical, but I don't think we think logically when it comes to spending money. Um, money is an emotional decision for people. And so in their mind, writing a check versus receiving a check are two completely different things. Even though you can put it down on paper and show them, that's a lot of money you could actually save by simply spending a little bit of money. And if you haven't been paying for marketing or you've been doing maybe 1%, it is a big adjustment to take that leap up. Um, but I don't know. I, I think you got a great point. I wish more people saw it that way because the PPOs, you're still paying for marketing. They're just doing it for you and they're charging you a hell of a lot more. So how long did you actually work with your husband in the dental office? Oh, believe me, we wouldn't be married if I actually worked with him in the practice. You never um, did? Not even no, 20 years ago? No, never did. I, I mean, I'd come in on Saturdays when we were young and I'd do payroll and some stuff like that. But um, I just did his marketing for him even when I was working for other agencies. And no, we, we would not work well together. We are far better partners separated when it comes to business. Interesting. Um, so, um, well, the, re the reason I brought that up is because uh, – uh, there's a lot of marriages in dental schools. I mean, um, oh, yeah. a, a lot of those women dentists uh, uh, marry uh, one of the guys in their class before they leave. So I'm just wondering if you had any uh, uh, marriage advice because they're, they're, they're complaining about their student loans. Uh, but, um, the you know, the divorce will cost them 10 times more than their student loans. So, you know, the best financial decision they'll ever make is not blowing their marriage. What What marriage advice would you give them? If they're both commuting to work right now, and they're both working together, or they're both in school, or they're on a date in uh, fourth year senior dental school, and they're going to get married, what advice would you give them? Well, if they absolutely insist on working together in the same practice, which first off, first advice would be find two totally different practices. Um, but I would say divide and conquer. Um, just like in my marriage at home, we have, you know, I'm in charge of one thing, Larry's in charge of something else. I take the internal house things, and he handles stuff outside of the house. So the same thing can happen um, in running a practice. One of the spouses should be in charge of human resources and hiring people and disciplining the team um, and continuing education. And somebody else should be in charge of the finances. And you have to respect and give each person the duties that they're best bound to do. Don't question them, support them, set goals together, but just let that person practice autonomously when it comes to those responsibilities. Yeah, I would remind them that the you know the three great monotheistic religions all have one god, and and the military, <laughs> you know there there's a there's an org chart, and the the only problem I see with it is when the staff doesn't see an org chart. When the staff sees two presidents, they're yep. extremely stressed out. 
when the staff asks the uh, the husband says go left and the wife says go right, their 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 wig out. People, it, it's kind of silly because if you look at the the natural ape, homo sapien, gorillas, chimpanzees, bonobos, orangutans, they all have a hierarchical form of of, sure. of leadership. So do the whales and the dolphins. And mm -hmm. the bonobos and the whales are, are women matriarch systems. Uh, did you know that on, on, the, on the other, on the bonobos, the gorillas, you know, the, it's, a, it's a male hierarchy. But the bonobos, it's a woman. And a lot of people have asked, well, what happens if a uh, male doesn't get in line? Uh, three female bonobos will jump the guy and beat the crap out of him. You know, it's three on one. They'll just, but, the, but the bottom line I'm telling you is that your biology prefers a hierarchical system. They, you know, you have the Pope, the Cardinal, the priest, the altar boy, and it's extremely stressful to sapien when they try to go to work every day and they're being told two different things from two different people. Same thing in kids. I mean, I used to play my dad off my mom and mom said, no, you'd ask dad. And if dad, you know, you, you'd play the parent and very few parents uh, are smart enough to get that right. You know, that they got to say, well, what did your mother say? <laughs> no, 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 well, no. Believe me, my kids went through that with us as well. And you, you got to learn to have a partnership. My husband's the one who will give in though, so they know to go to him first. Okay, final question. Uh, you promised me an hour of your life. And we're an hour and one minute. I got one overtime question. The num when I go to marketing on uh, Dentaltown, uh, there's a um, quarter million people on Dentaltown. 50,000 have downloaded the, the app. And mm -hmm. their number one question is, how do I increase my SEO? When someone says something like that, what would you say to that person? Um, honestly, I'm going to tell you as important as search engine optimization it, um, is, it's getting harder and harder to do. Google apparently does not have enough money, so they are forcing a pay-per-click model. So I believe um, that in order to increase your SEO, first of all, don't do it on your own. Hire a professional firm. There's people who know how to do this. There's actually a science to it but know that you're gonna to wanna to combine it with some sort of paid online advertising. Personally, um, Google AdWords, but I'm a big fan of Facebook ads right now. They are, this is the time to get in ground floor. They are dirt cheap and very targeted and effective. So just look at it big picture, whole thing. Okay, uh, Ryan, when we, when we release this podcast, let's drop it into the marketing category. So Dentaltown has 50 categories. We'll drive, if you're listening to this, we're gonna drop this in the marketing academy. Um, the question on the Facebook post is there's there's two different things. You you could make a post on your dental office Facebook page and boost it. Mm -hmm. And then there's another place to create an ad. What, what are, Do they have the same effectiveness? Or are they about the same? Can you talk about the difference in those two things? Well, it depends on the kind of message that you want to do. So um, let's say that you want to do a post that is on your page and you're trying to boost it. So you can boost to just your audience, which is great. Maybe you have... Uh, you want to announce a snow closure or you've got a uh, last minute cancellation you're trying to fill. So then you're reaching the people who already know you. Um, or if you're trying to promote something that you just want to reach really good patients, boosting lets you target your own audience and their friends who are probably going to have similar values. But if you really want to do the Facebook advertising, it gives you a lot more flexibility. You can drive people to your website, to a landing page, you can drive them to a call now action that you want them to immediately call the practice. I think there's just way more flexibility, a lot more targeting. And um, personally, I mean, I, I'm just finding the cost per click in Facebook ads. Even though Facebook will tell you it's around a buck to a buck and a half a click, we're seeing more in the 22, 25 cents a click. This is the time to get in on it. Well, hey, if you ever get bored, I wish you'd go on that marketing site. I'm reading the um, I'm reading the questions of today on the marketing. It says um, um, sudden decline in patients need urgent help by Denticus. Um, has any the next question today under marketing? Has anyone tried advertising on indoor billboards? Um, does anyone know anything about Doctor.com? Um, calling all dental marketing experts and dentists. There's a lot of desperation. Um, does Marketing call tracking numbers, uh, and and I'll and I'll tell you something else. There's a I don't want to say it. I don't want to get sued. But there's a lot of uh, a lot of complaining about Yelp. I, I don't blame them. I complain about Yelp too. On the other hand, it can be a phenomenal resource in the right market. Yeah, but uh, but I'll tell you. Um, I mean, there's just there's so many columns frustrated with Yelp. Um, I mean, there's entire. Yeah. There's entire uh, threads uh, that the titles are complaining about Yelp. What, um, 
I'm an old guy. I'm 54. Um, no, I've never seen, I've never been in a group with dentists my age that ever mentioned or looked at Yelp. I mean, I just haven't seen that. So I, I still think it's a millennial thing. I, is that true or false? Um, it, it's totally true. So the thing that's so great about Yelp is that millennials live and die on their phones. I mean, I, my phone is literally right here. It's right next to me. We, we can't live and breathe without them. And Yelp is kind of that default search engine that pops up when you're looking for reviews for any kind of a business, especially on an iPhone. Um, I find it's big in urban markets. You know, you're not going to see it in a small area like we are, but you go to Chicago or New York or Atlanta or, or Phoenix and it's one of the first places they go. People read reviews on everything and Yelpers, while you know doctors hate it because the negative reviews show up and a lot of times the positive reviews won't, um, the Yelpers go there. And so I think if the doctors pay a little more attention, pushing reviews to Yelp, sometimes even paying for that paid advertising for the visibility, they're gonna love the results. We see dozens and dozens of calls. It's not cheap, but it's actually a good return in the right market. Can I ask you one last overtime question? Absolutely. Um, Angie's list. No way. Two thumbs down. Not worth it. But will you explain why or, or it, it talk just, about it? it um, first of all, they started out as a paid model that anybody who wanted to get access to um, the businesses that were listed on Angie's list had to pay to get access instead of the other way around where the consumers were free and the businesses actually had to pay for any kind of visibility. They have just changed that model. I think at this point in time, they've kind of killed their reputation. People know it's difficult to access. Um, I just don't see a lot of traction on it for dentists. If you're going to go paid advertising, Yelp, Facebook, Google AdWords, those are really the best places to be. Well, hey, um, thank you so much for spending an hour with me and my homies today. I think you're uh, – uh, by the way, I called you. She didn't call me. Um, I've heard nothing but great things about you uh, for a long time. Uh, tell you. Larry he's a very lucky man. And <laughs> uh, thanks for uh, uh, coming on the show. We'll drop this always on iTunes. Uh, it'll be on YouTube, and it'll be on Dental Town. And when you launch your new product, uh, email me back, call me back. Maybe uh, we'll maybe we'll try it in my office. Maybe we'll we'll do a prototype of my uh, my today's dental in Phoenix. Absolutely, I'd love for you to be a beta tester. You're gonna love this thing. All right, well, good luck. I'm glad to see that uh, something you've been working on for four years is is coming out. I know that how fun that is. Absolutely. Thanks All for right. having me. All right, thank you. Have a great day. Bye bye.